Hello viewers, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about a, uh, another controversial subject, and that is, does man have a free will? Now no doubt you've perhaps read articles on the internet about this subject, or maybe seen some videos, and no doubt you have a, um, a belief system about this. Does man have a free will? Well, first of all, let's answer the question, what is the will? How do we define the will? And I like the definition that the late Arthur Pink used, and that is that the will is the faculty of choice, the immediate cause of all action. The faculty of choice. So in that sense, does man have a will? Yes, indeed he does. Uh, when I say man, I mean mankind, men and women. Uh, we all have a will um, because we can choose to do things or not to, to do things. For example, I can choose to drink this glass of water, okay, to take a sip of this water, should say. I can choose to pick up this pen, okay. can choose to hold this piece of paper in my hands. I have that ability, don't I? That's what I mean. I have that, that ability to choose. So that's kind of in a philosophical sense. But now in a theological sense, we have to approach this question in, in a different way. And um, the question is, does man have a free will when it comes to receiving Jesus Christ? Okay. Is, is man's will determinative in his salvation? It's the same question, basically, just worded differently. Um, let us look at what some godly men had to say about this subject, going back in history, uh, looking at uh, chapter 9 of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Now, a lot of you uh, professing Christians are not familiar with the confessions, but you should be. These were historical uh, writings put together by various um, men, theologians, Bible students, and they gathered together and they put down their thoughts on various doctrines and they backed them up. Most of them were backed up by Scripture. Well, let me just read what, what is said here on free will. And there's uh, five different points. Point number one, God has endued the will of man with that natural liberty that is neither forced nor by any absolute necessity determined good or evil. Okay? Now you may agree or disagree with these statements. Number two, man in his natural, or rather man in his state of innocency had freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God, but yet mutably or changeably, so that he might fall from it. Three, man by his fall into a state of sin has wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. Okay, so as a natural man being altogether adverse, averse rather, from that good, and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or prepare himself thereunto. For when God converts a sinner and translates him into the state of grace, he frees him from his natural bondage under sin, and by his grace alone enables him freely to will and to do that which is spiritually good. Yet so, as that by reason of his remaining corruption, he does not perfectly or only will that which is good, but does also will that which is evil. 5. The will of man is made perfectly and immutably free to do good only, or rather to do good alone in the state of glory only. Okay? So, um, let's look at some verses which back up these statements, and then we'll discuss this a little further. Uh, number one, God has endued the will of man with that natural liberty that is neither forced nor by any absolute necessity of nature determined 
good or bad. And the verses that are used are Matthew 17, 12. But I say unto you, that Elias has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they willed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. James 1.14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both you and thy seed may live. All right? Um, and then, let's see, man in a state of innocence, he had freedom and power to will to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God. And the scripture that is given is Ecclesiastes 7, 29. Lo, this only have I found, that God has made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Genesis 1, 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, and after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. All right? Um, man by his fall into a state of sin has wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good and accompanying salvation. Well, let's see. A lot of you disagree with that. Well, what does the Bible say? Remember, the Bible alone in its entirety is our authority. The writings of men carry only so much authority, depending on the credibility of that particular individual. But they're not infallible. Uh, and they are not without error. Um, now, you can make a statement that's true, and that is without error, uh, as long as it conforms to the Bible, to the Word of God. So that's why when, when we talk about the confessions or historic documents that were written by theologians and that, we have to be very careful that we don't hold these up on the same level as the Bible. Only the Bible in its entirety, the Bible alone in its entirety, is infallible and inerrant and gives us the perfect will of God. And all of the writings must be compared to the scriptures. Okay? So, we can quote various authors and men, but uh, they are not our authority ultimately. And that's the problem with a lot of churches today, they begin following men uh, this particular Bible scholar or this particular theologian and, um, and we really need to stick with the Bible alone. It's okay to, to read the confessions. The confessions summarize and encapsulate a lot of doctrine. They summarize um, in, 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 in um, how should I say it, propositional truths, certain doctrines, okay? And they were very carefully thought out and formulated better than perhaps we could do so. I mean, some of these confessions, they were formulated by a committee, so uh, a lot of thought was given to this, but uh, it doesn't hurt to examine these, these uh, confessions periodically and, and see what the scripture says. I can tell you that some of these confessions are wrong in particular doctrines. I'm not going to get into which doctrines they are, but uh, uh, it just goes to show that if we follow a confession um, without questioning it, then we put it on the same level of authority as the Bible. And in that, we do err. All right, now, Romans 5, 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. 8, 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. All right, John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, with, for without me you can do nothing. So, 
it would appear that man, while he has a will, uh, as a result of Adam's sin, he lost that freedom. He had freedom in the garden. He had freedom to eat of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He was not to eat of that tree. Um, and God allowed him to fall into sin. And basically that's what freedom is. See, if God would have kept him from sin, if God would have created him like a, uh, a puppet with no freedom whatsoever, no free will, he could have, God could have created Adam in such a way that he would have not sinned. Alright? Just like the angels, which never sinned. There were some angels that fell along with Lucifer. These were known as the non-elect angels. Uh, although the Bible, I don't think, uses that terminology. But obviously they were not chosen or prevented from falling. They had a freedom to fall. They had the freedom to serve God, and for a time they did, but then they fell from their first estate. Uh, there were those angels which never fell into sin. They were kept from falling, preserved. These were the elect angels. Um, now Adam, I believe, was, was one of God's elect, and that he was saved. God clothed him with animal skins, which shows that he, he made atonement for Adam and Eve's sin, and in fact, Adam is called in one of the Gospels a son of God. So he was obviously uh, born again into God's kingdom. But he was allowed to sin. He had that freedom. And so, um, and this could be a whole other discussion, but when we talk about the, the will of man, we have to understand it in different aspects. Uh, man in, in his innocent state before the fall then there is man's state after the fall then there is man's state after regeneration that is once the man has been born again his will takes on a whole different dimension and then there is the fourfold state the fourth dimension of man's will after he is glorified after he's been not only had a resurrected soul or been born into God's kingdom, but his body has been redeemed and been transformed into a glorious spiritual body, incorruptible. And that's a whole other dimension of man's will. And so this could get kind of deep if you explore all these. There's a great book on this, by the way, um, by Thomas Boston, I believe, called human nature in its fourfold state. And uh, you might want to look at that. You might be able to even get it on the internet. Um, okay. Uh, all right, so the question is, does man have a free will? Well, not when it comes to matters of salvation, because now that man has fallen into sin, he's fallen from his state of innocency, that Adam and Eve experienced into a state of sin. He's under the power of Satan. He's taken captive by him at his will. He's condemned because of unbelief. John 3.17, I believe, or 18 says, He that believeth is condemned already. He that believeth not or other is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So the wrath of God abides on all those who do not believe. Now, can a person who does not believe have a will to believe if that will is enslaved to sin and Satan? No. No, he doesn't. They that are, can, can, can a, let me ask you this, can a, can a sinner please God? Does he have the freedom to please God? Does he? A lot of you are saying, well, of course, he, he can please God. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. That's the state of the sinner before he's born again, before he's saved. And let's look at that. That's in Romans chapter 8, verse... Where are we at? Verse, uh, verse 8. So then they that are in the flesh 
cannot please God. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The sinner is not subject to the law of God. He does not submit himself to the law of God. He cannot obey the law of God. But the believer can obey the law of God because he has a freedom to obey the law of God. Not perfectly. Not perfectly because he still has a body which hasn't been redeemed. He still has remaining corruption. Okay? He still has remaining corruption in that body. Old habits, thoughts from the past when he was lost and under God's condemnation and wrath. Those things don't just disappear overnight because you're saved or born again. No. <laughs> Paul wrestled with these things. He said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? In Romans chapter 7. Paul was a saved man when he wrote that. Okay? So, but there, there is sanctification that takes place. We are progressively becoming holier and more set apart unto God and set apart from the world. Praise God for that. Now, um, uh, what else can we say about this? Um, let, let me use an illustration, by the way, that I like, that, that Pink used to use. He said, um, when it comes to, to the freedom of the will, because a lot of people say, well, God, does God force people to sin then? If everything is predetermined or ordained, and man doesn't have any freedom and he's a puppet, uh, no, God doesn't force anybody to sin. No more than, let's suppose I have this Bible in my hand. Okay? I remove my hand. What happens? The Bible falls down. Always down. Why? In answer to the law of gravity. I didn't force the Bible down. I didn't slam it down or throw it down or push it down. It simply removed the hand of restraint. When that hand was removed, the Bible fell of its own weight because of the law of gravity. Now this isn't original with me. This is an illustration that the late Arthur Pink used and I love it. You see, that's the same thing when it comes to God. God doesn't force you to sin. He simply removes his hand of restraint. His hand of restraint could be interpreted as maybe the Holy Spirit. All right? But anyway, His power keeps you from sinning. God has kept many people in the Bible from sinning, and yet their freedom was never dis destroyed or removed or eliminated in any way. Okay? They were still free to do what they wanted to do. You see? Now, a lot of people, you know, they have problems with this idea of free will. They have to maintain free will because they think, well, then, then especially in matters of election, um, because otherwise uh, God is, is, is forcing people to be saved or chosen who might not have wanted to be saved. Uh, or maybe people are prevented from being saved, who really of their free will wanted to be saved, but because they weren't chosen or elected, they couldn't be. No, no, no. Nobody is ever going to be lost who wanted to be saved, who truly wanted to be saved on God's terms. All right? And everybody that's damned will be damned because of their unbelief, because they hated God in their heart, in their deepest part of their being. They really didn't want to do God's will. They loved their sin. They loved their unbelief. Their unbelief being that they did not believe the words of Christ. They did not believe the Bible as the word of God. They did not take heed to what the Bible said. You see? And there's a lot of professing Christians that just look at this Bible Oh, they'll acknowledge that it's the Word of God. Yes, it's inspired, but they don't really read it seriously. They don't have a high enough view of God's Word. They don't fear and tremble when they read it. You know, when they come in before the assembly of the saints, it says, um, 
that we are to, uh, that God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all those that are about him. That's what the Bible teaches. And, and yet you see that the church today, the local churches, is kind of like a social club. People get together, there's a lot of noise going on, a lot of talk about secular activities and sports and maybe carnal subjects which have nothing to do really with worship. And that's why we gather together, to worship God in spirit and in truth. They that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Alright, so now getting back to the will of man. Man's will before he's converted is, is bound. It's not free. It's not free to please God. And certainly his will cannot determine his destination. No. God's will is determinative. And, but man's will, prior to his being saved or born again, is only free in one direction. To please self. Yeah, you can please yourself. You can do all kinds of things to please yourself. You have that freedom. And if you have more money, you can please yourself a little bit more luxuriously, can't you? Through travel and, and entertainment and uh, yachts and cruises and luxury home and a car and so on. Yeah, you can please yourself. Everything centers around yourself before you're born again. But once you've entered into God's kingdom, now and only then are you free to please God. So you have a free will now to please God. Does this make any sense to you? I hope it does. I hope I'm, I'm on track with what the Bible teaches. And if I'm not, then I'm sure I'll be corrected by somebody out there. Just post a comment. But this is how we learn. The Spirit of God working through us as we examine what the Bible teaches. And we compare Scripture with Scripture to come to truth. Um, well, I don't want to make this any longer, but... Uh, I hope this answers your question, or answers the question, does man have a free will? Uh, we didn't look at everything in this confession. I did read the five points. Uh, it's obvious that uh, the will of man is made perfectly and immutably free to do good alone in the state of glory only because that will be sanctification perfected. When he's glorified, he will have a perfect body and to join with his perfect spirit or soul. Okay? So there can be no sin in the state of glory in heaven. Everything will be sinless. You'll be completely pure, free only to worship and serve God. There will be no selfish motives. There will be no um, transgression of sin because you will be Totally perfect. Now that is God's will for you now in one sense, and it's revealed well. He says, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So we are to strive for sinless perfection now. Don't make excuses for your sin. If you're saying, well, nobody's perfect, that, that's the wrong attitude. <laughs> I remember once in high school, I, uh, I told this friend of mine who's now deceased, but uh, he died maybe three to five years after we graduated from high school, but I'll never forget. He was Roman Catholic, and I once told him, I says, what was his name? Uh, Waller. Is that his first name? Waller. Oh, that was his last name. Anyway, I said, well, nobody's perfect, so then we shouldn't try to be perfect, because nobody can be perfect, so why, why try to be perfect? He says, no. And he was right, and I was wrong. You see, we should try to be perfect, but you're going to fail again and again as you measure yourself, not by man's standard. We seem pretty good when we measure ourselves by man's standard, but when you measure yourself by God's standard. So anyway, um, think these things through and get back to me with any comments you have. Love your feedback and may the Lord richly bless you.